much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very sorry I couldn't make it and be physically present as well. Uh, I hope this uh, uh, technological aid will compensate my absence in, in part, at least. Um, well, uh, actually, uh, my uh, perspective on the uh, on the 1903 pogrom uh, is uh, a bit uh, broader, uh, starting from my uh, stemming from my research interests in uh, imperial policies in the borderlands. Uh, so I will try to connect it uh, to the wider processes uh, that uh, were were underway in this period, and also. Uh, to uh, assess its implications, its significance uh, for uh, the uh, for the uh, uh, policies of the Russian Empire uh, towards the Jewish question uh, as a whole. Uh, but uh, I would like to start, of course, with some general data on uh, Bessarabia, uh, Bessarabia's Jewish community in the 19th century, uh, just to give you. Uh, and view of the context, uh, and you really did that up to an extent already, um, but uh, some statistical data I think uh, might be uh, in order here. So, uh, at the moment of Bessarabia's annexation to the Russian Empire uh, in 1812, uh, there were around 20,000 uh, Jews uh, in Bessarabia, uh, who of course have only very approximate uh, figures, uh, uh, and uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, during the 1897 census, uh, uh, which, which I might uh, emphasize, uh, consider only Jews, only those who declared themselves uh, religiously Jews, of course. Uh, so uh, at the end of the 19th century, 1997, we have uh, uh, around 230,000 Jews in Bessarabia, Arabia, accounting for 11.8 percent of the total population of the uh, Uberbia. Um, and uh, most of the Jewish population was concentrated in the northern parts of the, of the province, uh, where there were several towns with Jewish majorities, uh, like for example uh, Khotin, where they account for more than 50 percent, Soroka uh, or He uh, in the center of the Bessarabia as well. Uh, and uh, there, were, there was a a smaller concentration of the Jewish population in the southern part of the Uberbia. Uh, in the capital, Kishinev, that will feature prominently, of course, in, in my presentation, uh, around 1900, uh, the Jewish population accounted for around 45, 46% uh, of the population, almost half of the population. Um, now, uh, several words uh, about the uh, legal condition of the Jewish community in this Arabia. Generally, it followed, of course, the, the provisions uh, that uh, were, were functioning in the empire as a whole. Uh, that is, uh, the uh, legal status of the uh, Jewish community was stipulated, or was regulated by the so-called uh, uh, regulation concerning the Jews, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, decreed in 1804. Uh, and then was revised in 1835, if we are talking about the first half of the 19th century. Um, Sarabia, however, occupied a, an ambiguous position uh, with regard to the Pale Settlement, in the sense that although, for all technical purposes, it was part of the Pale, uh, this legislation, the restrictive legislation on Jewish, uh, uh, on Jewish uh, movement, was uh, extended uh, of, of step by step to Bessarabia. So in the 1820s, I'm especially important in this regard. Uh, uh, by 1826, uh, basically Bessarabia became a full fledged part of the Pale Settlement. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, policy was also reflected in the uh, local regulations, that is, the legislative uh, acts that were re regulating Bessarabia's status within the empire uh, as a whole. Uh, that is uh, mainly the statute of 1818, which, um, uh, which uh, well, uh, consecrated as Arabia's autonomy. Uh, however, this autonomy was quite short-lived. It was curtailed and then abolished in 1828. Um, 
So, uh, uh, what is important to note in, uh, in the case of Bessarabia is that initially the Jewish uh, merchants, especially, uh, that moved to Bessarabia had some privileges in comparison with their uh, co religionists in other parts of the empire. Uh, but also that after the 1830s, uh, we can see an increasingly restrictive legislation applied specifically to the Bessarabian region. For example, in 1839, uh, the uh, Committee of Ministers of the Empire forbade this Jewish settlement uh, 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 along the 50, uh, 50 kilometer line uh, along the border. Uh, although this regulation was not applied systematically or consistently. Um, so, uh, and another interesting feature of Jewish life in Bessarabia was, uh, starting from the 1840s, uh, the uh, formation, the creation of agricultural colonies, uh, which uh, were part of the design of the uh, imperial authorities to integrate the Jews into the, uh, what, what, what were called at the time, useful occupations, that is, to uh, make peasants out of Jews in a way, uh, and uh, this project was, uh, well, did not did not fail immediately in the sense that even uh, in the second half of the, 19th, of, the, of the 19th century, around 10% of the Bessarabian Jewish population lived in these agricultural colonies that were concentrated mostly in the north uh, of Bessarabia. Um, well, I guess I won't dwell too much on the uh, self-governing uh, bodies of the Jewish population that were actually similar, the Kahal, uh, the similar in Bessarabia uh, as uh, compared to, to the other regions of the empire. Uh, what is also interesting to note, however, is that the rate of literacy uh, among the Jewish population in Bessarabia uh, was quite high, especially compared to the other uh, ethnic communities. That is, according to the census data of 1897, uh, 49.6% of the Jewish men uh, were illiterate, compared to 34.5% of Jewish women, uh, which made the Jews the, the second most literate community in Bessarabia after the Germans, and anyway was several times higher than uh, the average for the other uh, Christian uh, uh, communities. Um, so, well, uh, this is just uh, this, uh, this is just an image of uh, where the Bessarabian Jews stood, uh, so to say, socially and culturally uh, at the end of the 19th century. But of course, uh, the, 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 their economic role should be also uh, emphasized. Uh, and starting from the second half of the 19th century, the Jewish merchants, merchants especially, were very important intermediaries in export operations, uh, mostly in cereal and wine exports. Uh, so their economic uh, importance increased uh, as the century went on. And of course, the turning point uh, in uh, their situation as uh, in the whole of the Russian Empire came in the early 1880s, where uh, with the so-called temporary regulations of 1882 that signified a, well, uh, not a rupture actually, but a departure, let's, let's, let's say, from the, uh, from the policies of Alexander II's reign, uh, during the 1860s and 70s, which tried a limited, uh, a limited uh, policy of, well, assimilation, I would say, although, of course, uh, this was only, uh, only valid mostly for educational institutions and for uh, not for economic activities, really. Well, in 1882, uh, the temporary regulations forbade explicitly uh, the Jewish, Jewish settlements in rural areas, uh, and uh, actually contributed to the widespread suspicion uh, among the authorities uh, of the whole Jewish community, uh, which of course was not absent before, but now it acquired almost a legal basis, uh, in the sense that the police were, uh, had acquired the right to, uh, to, uh, for surveillance of the, whole, of the whole Jewish community in order to limit their mobility. Uh, and, uh, of course, another important factor was the revolutionary movement. Uh, so that what we have, uh, where, where the Jews were quite, were quite uh, well represented. So what we have uh, in the early 20th century 
let's say, let us say before the Kishinev pogrom, is a combination of uh, the rising wave of anti-Semitism in many parts of Russian society, uh, and very importantly, uh, in many parts of the Russian bureaucracy as well. Uh, then we have the complicating factor of revolutionary socialism, with which Jews start to be associated. And of course, we have uh, the widespread and the endemic, I would say, economic anti-Semitism of the peasantry, uh, in the sense of uh, a, very, uh, a very negative attitude toward the Jewish, uh, the economic activities of the Jewish community. Uh, which was fomented by the radical activists, journalists, and part of the uh, local officials, uh, and all, all uh, this. This is the this combination of all these elements is actually the structural premise, if I may use this uh, phrase, for the pogrom, uh, in, in the sense that uh, both on the local level and on the central level, there are various signals that, as it were, define the whole Jewish community as alien, uh, as dangerous, and uh, at least as marginal uh, in uh, the empire's social fabric. Uh, and here, uh, I would anticipate my main <coughs> argument here, uh, is uh, where the main responsibility, so to say, of the, of the government lies, in that it uh, tolerated and partially encouraged uh, this atmosphere. Um, well, uh, just uh, several uh, several uh, uh, things about the Kishinev Jewish community in the early 20th century. So as I said earlier, uh, they constituted about 45% of the total population. Uh, they were uh, uh, they, they mostly, the community mostly consisted of poor merchants and craftsmen living quite precariously, uh, but it also included a number of well well, well entrepreneurs who were the main targets for these increasingly for these accusations of uh, increasingly persistent accusations of Jewish economic domination uh, and and uh, so on and so forth that defined the economic anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, here, uh, in this in this sense, uh, we have uh, a combination of local uh, well uh, local uh, actors. Uh, First and foremost, the local church hierarchy, uh, the local radical press, the right wing press, uh, and a part of the local officials uh, that were the main protagonists of what happened uh, during the Easter of 1903 in Kishinev. Um, generally, uh, the direct responsibility for the pogrom, or so to say, the uh, moral authorship of the pogrom, is. Uh, um, was associated with the well-known journalist Pavel Kusherban, uh, a quite notorious figure at the time, a, f uh, a person who was also involved uh, in the uh, forgery of the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, so he was one of the authors of this document. Um, uh, and Kusherban, uh, who, interestingly, was initially close to liberal circles in his youth, gradually became one of the most radical proponents of extreme right and anti-Semitic ideas in, in Bessarabia, and not only in Bessarabia. Uh, so he viewed the Jews not simply as dangerous aliens, but in line with the emerging modern anti-Semitism, as a well-organized group of conspirators aiming at achieving primarily economic, but also cultural dominion over the Christian population. Um, and uh, he, uh, his, his press, uh, the press he, uh, he actually well, uh, patronized, was one uh, of the most effective uh, means to uh, change or to, to influence the, the, the mood of the emerging public opinion in the context of the pogrom. Although uh, his personal participation in the pogrom was minimal in the sense that he was living in St. Petersburg at the time, he was coordinating another of his editorial projects, the newspaper Znamia, the banner, uh, which also uh, became quite, quite influential in right-wing circles. Uh, nevertheless, his associates, uh, like the uh, infamous Georgi Pronin, which, uh, who, who, who uh, is worth a uh, closer look, I'm not, I'm not sure I have time, of course, for that, and uh, his, he, the press uh, he was coordinating uh, were the main uh, vehicles for uh, the, uh, the anti-Semitic propaganda that led actually to the 
uh, to the pogrom itself. Uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, we have a, a very a context that was uh, uh, conducive to uh, uh, to uh, the outbreak of ethnic violence, both structurally at the imperial level uh, and locally in Bessarabia. And it was the combination of these factors uh, which uh, actually led to the, uh, to the events and their consequences. Um, of course, one of the major questions that dominated the historiography right from the beginning and throughout the 20th and early 21st century was the role of the local authorities. And we have, of course, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, a big historiography uh, of the pogrom, uh, starting from the classical work of uh, Edward Judge, then in the early 90s, there uh, appeared uh, yeah, a number of Russian language uh, analyses. Uh, I won't get well on that too much. It's well known, I think, in a way. Um, but the role of the local authorities is indeed a crucial question. And of course, the main, um, well, the main uh, topic here is the responsibility of the government. Uh, many liberal critics at the time and many historians after that directly accused the government of fomenting the pogrom, organizing secretly, covertly uh, the pogrom, or at least uh, being complicit with the pogromists. Um, which actually, if one scrutinizes the evidence that was put forward, is not certain in the sense that the government did not directly uh, order, for example, the, the pogromists to act. It, it did not directly order the authorities to uh, ignore uh, what was happening and to tolerate that. But, of course, uh, it did send very mixed signals at best, and signals which encouraged uh, the active participants in the pogrom to uh, act as they did. Uh, for example, the role of the governor, uh, who actually issued all responsibility, who did not take uh, measures to quell the unrest quickly, although he personally was not an anti-Semite, uh, and who, moreover, delegated his responsibilities to the vice governor, uh, who was uh, a staunch and vicious anti-Semite, uh, representing that part of the Russian bureaucracy that viewed the Jews as a constant danger. Uh, so, in a way, uh, this lack of action, inefficiency, uh, and lack of coordination between institutions left uh, the most radical uh, part of the bureaucracy in control, I mean, radically uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semite part of the bureaucracy in control, um, uh, and uh, uh, led to uh, the consequences that were, uh, that were quite tragic. Um, now, another, uh, another uh, institution that was very important here, especially in an informal role, was the church. And by the way, uh, I had the opportunity to look into the press uh, that I mentioned, Kusharvan's newspaper, Besarabets, in Petersburg recently. I just browsed through it quite attentively. And what, was, what struck me was that, contrary to what, what, what I was expecting, there were a few open appeals to attack the Jews, almost none. Apparently, uh, these appeals were much more efficiently propagated through the church, and some contemporaries left quite interesting memoirs to this, uh, to this effect. Uh, so the press was not the only uh, vehicle. Of course, we tend to overemphasize, I think, its importance in a way, because it was the most modern and mass uh, vehicle for, for that kind of, of uh, propaganda. I think the church in the Mesoarabian case played a quite important role as this informal, well, informal in the sense not uh, uh, oral, right, right uh, mostly, network of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, influencing the masses. So uh, I'm not quite sure about this point, but I would like to discuss it if, if uh, of course, you're interested. Uh, because uh, the question of what were the, actually the vehicles for, the, uh, for this propaganda is quite important. Um, and again, uh, if, if we look at the Russian bureaucracy, uh, we see a very mixed picture, I mean, the role of the, uh, of the, of the authorities, because uh, some of them, like the Kishinev mayor, Karl Schmidt, 
uh, where quite, had quite good relations with the Jewish community. He was one of the defenders of the Jewish community during the ensuing trial. Uh, and, uh, and also, one could say that some of the authorities in the sphere of, uh, well, uh, justice were quite equi well, equitable uh, in the, during the trial as well. Uh, but again, I would insist on the importance of central signals sent from St. Petersburg uh, that allowed uh, this outbreak of violence to be considered as something normal, that uh, allowed the, the bureaucrats to consider the, the, what they perceived, of course, as the interests of the Christian population instead of the interests of the Jewish community as being important. And most of all, which constructed this absolutely distorted image of Jewish responsibility for the uh, pogrom, uh, in the sense that uh, if, if we look at, the, at what was the, uh, well, the consequence, the uh, legal consequence of the pogrom, it was a circular of the, the Ministry of the Interior forbidding, uh, uh, banning all self-defense organizations of the Jews. So this tells us what both the minister in Petersburg played there and his subordinates, like the head of the police department who went to Bessarabia immediately after the pogrom, thought about the Jews. So again, they did not provoke the pogrom directly, they did not foment the pogrom, but they did all they could to create an, uh, uh, well, an atmosphere uh, and a context that uh, somehow uh, well, uh, affected the whole, uh, the whole vision of uh, what the Jews represented. Um, uh, well, I won't dwell on the events themselves too much, uh, because uh, I think they are well, well known in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, well, generally, uh, but uh, the, the direct consequences included 51 dead, uh, including 49 Jews, around 580 uh, wounded, uh, 1,300 damaged buildings, uh, and the total damage was estimated at uh, around 2 million rubles, which was a colossal, a huge sum for, for that period. Uh, and a very interesting point also concerns the ethnic and social composition of the pogromists, because this was a, uh, actually a, uh, uh, a problem, that, uh, an issue that uh, was quite difficult to ascertain at the time, but judging from who was arrested, the cross-section of those who were arrested and then tried and so on and so forth, uh, it, it is clear that uh, no single group dominated, that the social and ethnic composition of these people, around 2,000 people who were actively involved in the pogrom, was actually uh, re well, a representation of the uh, Kishinev social and ethnic structure, in the sense that the majority were uh, great Russians and little Russians, where, uh, uh, about a third were Moldavians, including from neighboring villages. Uh, so in a way, it reflected the ethnic structure of the Christian population of Kishino and the, its surroundings. Uh, and of course, uh, this, this tells us that uh, the anti-Semitic propaganda was directed uh, not at specific ethnic groups, but at the Christian population as a whole. And it was perceived as such. Um, so, what, uh, I guess I have just a few minutes uh, more, um, uh, what is interesting is, besides the, uh, the pogrom itself that, uh, that went on during uh, two days, the 6th and the 7th of April, uh, it is the dynamics of the, of the events, because uh, during the first day, during Easter itself, Easter Sunday, uh, the, uh, well, uh, the people who were involved in the pogrom was the targeted properties, not people. And the, the lack of action of the government was uh, the factor which led to the, uh, uh, the events of the 7th of April, the second day, when actually all, most of the deaths occurred. So again, this proves that the inefficiency, the lack of action, and the uh, covert, I would say, complicity of a part of the Russian bureaucracy uh, led to uh, the apex of the pogrom. Uh, on the afternoon of the 7th of April, uh, when the army intervened, uh, the pogrom was very quickly, uh, very quickly uh, uh, put down. So again, 
uh, well, there is no direct evidence of uh, uh, the, government here respons uh, the government's responsibility for the pogrom. It is clear that these signals from St. Petersburg uh, and the support of the radical press, uh, the fostering of anti-Semitic tendencies uh, throughout Russian society uh, by uh, the public opinion and the government, and the discriminatory anti-Jewish legislation all of these factors provided a favorable context for this for this violent episode. Um, and I would only uh, invoke the, uh, the example of a Bessarabian official, uh, the governor who was sent to investigate the pogrom, basically Prince Russo, who left very interesting memoirs about his attitude toward the Jewish community, about his uh, uh, actions during this post pogrom period, uh, who was a liberal, uh, a liberal uh, official by persuasion, who was later a deputy of the first Duma, and who used the pogrom as uh, not a pretext, but you know, uh, the, um, the uh, as, a, as a topic by, uh, uh, that, that he used to criticize the whole policy of the Russian government uh, uh, in the uh, on the borderlands, and he uh, said that. Well, one of his assertions, besides uh, blaming indirectly the government of the pogrom, was that uh, to prevent such events in the future, one should treat uh, every citizen of Russia uh, as an equal, uh, as an equal subject. Which, of course, was exactly what uh, this part, uh, this uh, rightist part of the Russian bureaucracy did not do. But it also pointed to a much larger problem, and the problem was the. Uh, complicity of the imperial court, uh, which was obvious after the 1905 revolution, uh, with the right-wing circles, and its very negative attitude towards the uh, bureaucracy, uh, towards the legalistic bureaucracy uh, that tries to, pre to preserve this even-handed attitude towards the minorities. So, in fact, we had two centers of power in St. Petersburg. One around the imperial court and the Tsar himself, uh, who was which was extremely anti-Semitic, extremely, uh, I would say, uh, well, um, biased towards uh, the Jewish community uh, in particular and all the non-Russian minorities in general. And another center uh, represented by these liberal bureaucrats that were still quite influential, I would say, that tried to reform the Jewish policy. And this was uh, a clash that became open during the 1905 revolution when uh, uh, figures like Vita, the prime minister, uh, and even, by the way, Stolypin, uh, the next prime minister, who was not a liberal at all, uh, w wanted to achieve uh, Jewish emancipation, or at least to uh, get rid of the restrictive laws. Well, as we know, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, tendency prevailed. Uh, so, since I have no time left, uh, I would say that, in a way, to conclude, uh, the Kishinev pogrom was symptomatic uh, and symbolic from several points of view. First of all, even if it was not the first pogrom that uh, exhibited modern anti-Semitism, because the first such pogroms were, uh, were uh, took place during the 1880s, it came after a 20-year break, as it were, in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, outburst of ethnic violence. So that is why it was a shock, both to contemporaries and uh, to, in a way, to later historians. Secondly, it, it could be said that the Kishinev pogrom inaugurated the cycle of violence that continued during the, uh, uh, during the 1905 7 revolution, when Kishinev witnessed another pogrom in October 1905, due, uh, immediately after the uh, uh, publication of the October Manifesto. And uh, so, in a way, it signified, the pogrom in, in Kishinev signified the advent of, the, of mass politics, which of course, and I would love to discuss it during the, the next, uh, during the Q&A uh, session, which of course was uh, linked to the nature of economic modernization in Russia, because modern anti-Semitism was directly linked to the nature of capitalism and to the role of the Jewish community that was both real and perceived uh, in this process. So actually, uh, it was a part of the critique of modernization as such. Uh, and 
finally, uh, I would say that this, this unity, inefficiency, rivalry, and occasionally uh, within the Russian bureaucracy, and occasionally open, cajoling of radically nationalistic elements uh, that uh, underpin the actions of the Russian government, uh, provide a glimpse of all the difficulties that the Russian Empire encountered in accommodating its Jewish community, and of course in defining its uh, specificity with regard to, uh, to the other imperial players like Austria, Hungary, or nation states like Romania that we will be discussing today. Uh, thank you very much.